Hi, this is Anne Ketuhi, and I wanted to welcome you to the Healthy and Thriving Soil Formula. This is a continuation of our series, the um, five-step garden formula, epic garden formula. And we are continuing on with the things that actually make a difference in your, in your gardening. Today's topic is about soils. And I just wanted to invite you to get to learn with us and to get to understand why soils are so important. In fact, one of the reasons that I mentioned that it's the thriving and healthy soil formula is because for me, everything starts with the soil. I've always said that the secret uh, to an organic garden is the soil. And as we go through this uh, today's session, you're going to understand and see why um, you have to start with the soil. It doesn't matter whether you're growing vegetables, whether you're growing fruits, or whether you're growing flowers. If you don't pay attention to your soil, it, it, it doesn't matter what else you do. You know, you could have garden pests, and most of them actually come in when the plants are not doing well because the soil is not he healthy. I always say, feed the soil and the soils will feed the plants and the plants will feed you. So today's session is just to go over an overview of what does it take to have good soils? What do you need to do as a home gardener or even a commercial gardener if that's what you are? In terms of improving what you're growing. So we are going to see um, as what I call my own recipe when it comes to soils. But also when the soils are not doing well, you can always tell when the soils are not doing well. And of course, there are other things that come in and interact with the soil, like whether you're adding organic matter or whether you're adding fertilizers or whether you're adding compost, all of those matters. But of course, also, if you overwater your soil, then they won't do well. So in this session, I just wanted you to, to have an, an, an idea of what do you need to do to your soil. When it comes to adding fertilizers, what kind of fertilizers should you be adding? It's driven by science, in a sense, because it's driven by what is already in your soil. And if you are able to do a soil test, like I mentioned last week, then you get to know what is your soil pH, what is the status of your soil, what nutrients are there in a general manner, so that you know what fertilizers to put in. But more important for me is the organic matter whether you're putting compost or you're putting manure, it doesn't matter. And the type of manure also doesn't matter. You know, you could be putting chicken manure or cow manure or, you know, guana manure, wherever you have available horse manure. It has to be, of course, cooked. We always say it has to be cooked, meaning it's mature. It is not manure that is coming straight from the pottery house to your garden or from the cow shed to your garden. It's something that has been sitting out there. It's already dried out and it doesn't come to cause any harm to the plants. And then of course, we have to think about the fertilizer and, and the fertilizers depends on what you're growing. So we'll go over now an overview of that. So I'm gonna step in, I'm gonna share my slides here just now, just so that we can see what we are going to be learning. The formula for healthy soils, healthy and fertile soils. That's what we are looking at today. Like I said, healthy soils equals healthy plants. We always say build the soil organic matter first. On the left side here, you see this is a compost pile. And when you create compost, you could, of course, for those who have the space, you can always cover it with a top, like what you're seeing here. But also there's something we call a, a thermometer, a compost thermometer, just to let you know if the compost has cooked long enough, and uh, that is it's broken long enough, and the temperature normally rises. We are gonna have a session on composting on its own. So we'll go through what you need to know about the compost when you're putting it together. But of course here there is, you can always buy it from the garden center. You can go in and buy the compost as you see here. And of course we talked about the soil and you can see here, of course, how the compost teams up when it's really the microorganisms have been doing their job and they are cooking it. They are, they are breaking down the stuff that needs to be broken down and in the process, heat is generated. So when we go through the five steps of what you need to do in your compost, you'll understand all these processes. 
but you probably have seen compacted and healthy soils. This is a place I had seen over here. And you can tell, even without you stepping over that soil, that that soil is not healthy. We live in an island, for those of you who are listening, if you live in a place where you have more clay soil, that is okay. It's still the same issues. But here, our soils have got, they are sandy soils. And these are soils that are really, um, not only compacted out better, also the organic matter was not there. So you can see how the plants, of course, are not doing well. Besides which, they are growing in the wrong place. These, these are supposed to be under shade. So improving your soil organic matter starts with several things that we could look at. We won't go through all of them today, but we'll be going through them little by little. Of course, adding organic matter, or whether you're fertilizing, using organic fertilizers or just regular fertilizers, that's one way, of course. But of course, adding cover crops, which is another session we are going to have. Um, adding compost, that is something you can either create your own compost or buy, you know, from the places where you buy your burning stuff. Biologically based soil amendments. And when you see that the foundation of organic production is healthy soil, this was a soil actually I had seen somewhere where somebody was doing, it's almost like a lasagna. They were layering the soil, first of all, adding cardboards at the bottom, and then they added uh, soil, they added straw, they added wood chips, they added uh, regular soil, they added compost and manure. They were near a brewery, so they could add the dregs from the brewery. And so they heap up the soil. It's almost like when you're making a lasagna. But then what happens is that if you live in a temperate land, you let this soil stay over the winter time so that in the springtime, the soil is ready for planting. So you can do that if you have your own way. But I wanted to show you what happens when the soils are really neglected. This was a citrus orchard that the home gardener had um, uh, taken up one of my consulting services. And he had bought this land, and this is how his citrus trees looked like when he had that land. And he was, of course, so distressed. The owner of, the previous, of that land, uh, the orchard and the land, of course, had neglected these citrus over 20 years. They looked terrible. They were full of dead woods. They had full of bags, and the soil was completely not good. So we started working with the home gunner. This was barely six, six months ago, uh, six, in six months to a year, that's what his orchard looked like. We went through a whole process of pruning, but amending the soil. We started with the soil. He happened to be in an area where the soil is very acidic. It rains a lot there. For those of you who are probably from Hawaii, this is a, a haiku. But it doesn't matter where it is. It's that the place, it rains a lot, and therefore the soils are very acidic. And therefore the, the nutrient needed then um, were different from if you live in a place where you have alkaline soils. And so what had happened was that this, they needed, first of all, to raise the pH. The pH was very low. It was very acidic. It was 4.5. They needed to, we added magnesium sulfate. We added all kinds of organic fertilizers as well, and amended the soil. We added compost and topsoil, and we added, of course, mulch. And I'm telling you, it was like these trees were just waiting. And we had a, a regular fertilizer schedule. We started on a three, every three months, we were adding the fertilizers. And that's how they happened to be. So you can see that later. I mean, they were just breaking. In fact, the branches, some of the places he had to get stakes. Look at that. He had to stake the branches because they were bending over. They were almost breaking, you know, they had so much fruit. But when it comes to amending the soil, and even when you're planting, this was a home gun I was working with, and she had a citrus tree. We were planting that, and she had gotten one of the bigger trees. It was, I think, a 15-gallon tree, and so it was a big tree. So the first thing, of course, you have to get a big hole. You have to create a, a, a hole wider than the, the, the diameter of the, the tree, but amending that soil, you can see how that soil is looking so good. It was added compost and manure and topsoil and, and, and the amendments that I'm going to show you here. And eventually that tree, within a very short time, in fact, in three weeks, three months, sorry, because it was already a mature tree, you were already seeing fruits. It was doing very well. So you start there. So this was the previous home gardener that I had shown you, where I said the trees were so neglected. We created that basin. We improved the soil, we added, you know, compost and manure and uh, topsoil, 
and and we also removed the grass that was close to the tree so that it doesn't cause competition. So we added organic matter and the soil started improving and the trees responded. And of course, it doesn't matter. This was another home Ghana where she, this one's, in fact, she grows her lemons and limes at a higher elevation. So they really look good. This person, she harvests over 80 pounds of lemons and limes and citrus every week. And she takes them to a place where she sells them. So you can see the soil. You have to start with the soil. This is the same person I was showing you re recently in the last episode where we were planting asparagus. This was a home gardener who was uh, growing asparagus. And this person was actually moving away. And he had uh, these asparagus growing in his yard. He didn't want to throw them away. So he gave them to his friend. But the majority of the time was spent in preparing that soil. You can tell that soil looks great. You know, we added a lot of phosphorus fertilizers and compost because that's what asparagus like. And that soil was friable. It was nice and soft. It was easy to work with. And in one month, those asparagus were already starting to show signs of growing. And in a year, he was harvesting asparagus. So it doesn't matter whether you're starting with a vegetable garden. If you're starting that vegetable garden, you raise, you know, the raised beds. I'm going to show you the recipe I spoke about that you need to add to your garden so that your, your raised beds, so that your soil, look, your, your vegetables will grow. And this is the, the recipe. Two parts of topsoil, one part of compost, one part of what I call a soilless media, like peat moss or sphagnum moss or vermiculite or peat. This was the home gunner that I was working with and she had, she bought this online, the Canadian sphagnum peat moss. And so when I say two parts, it's in, you know, you just do your own combination based on those ratios. It's like when you're making a cake, you have flour and eggs and sugar and all that. So here she had two parts of these big bags and she bought them online. And then she had her topsoil. And then, so this was the organic topsoil which she, she bought. And then she added one of these soilless media. And the purpose of the soilless media is to improve the soil. It's to have air in the soil. Uh, they don't add any nutrients as such, it, whether you're using peat moss or sphagnum peat moss or perlite or vermiculite, you just buy those. They make it lighter, the soil to be lighter. So you add that. And so she started adding in her raised bed in the ratios we had talked about. So she added her topsoil. So she had her topsoil and her compost and her soilless media. She was using sphagnum peat moss. That's the one she bought. But you can take any of this and you can add it in the same ratios. And so she continued to add, and that's how her garden was growing and developing. And of course, mixing them all up. And in no time, she had a really good garden. And I can tell you, her vegetables were just so happy as soon as she, have, she planted them. But she took the time to improve her soil. So improving the soil organic matter, you fertilize with either organic sources, maybe that's your, your preference, any of these organic sources could be okay. Blood meal, bone meal, ground rock phosphate, seaweed, fish bone meal, fish emulsion, soybean meal, any of those that you get in the garden center. You add as much as of the organic matter as you can get. It doesn't matter whether you have clay soils or you have sandy soils. You need to improve them with organic matter because that's how the soils over time, they settle and they become good. You have cover crops if you have the ability to have those cover crops. So green manure, something we are going to talk about uh, later. Compost, like I said, or animal manure, biologically based soil amendments. That's the key. When you add those, that organic matter, sometimes you buy it. Like this was composted chicken manure fertilizer. You can see it comes. Sometimes it does have the nutrients 3 to 2, which means 3% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 2% potassium. But you're adding any of this into the soil, whether you're growing things on the ground or whether you're growing things on top of the, uh, in a raised bed. So pottery manure, bone meal, fish meal, fish emulsion, compost, any of these, seaweed, any of this is good enough for your soil. So, you know, in selecting organic nutrient sources, of course, you've got to remember that the, the larger the amount, the better. Like I say, this is uh, the nutrient here is just 3% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 2% potassium. But if you had one with a higher number, then buy that if you can. 
So the best approach to long-term soil fertility and soil health, the key to successful organic gardening is to feed the soil with organic matter, which feeds the plant. And it should be about 5%. The organic matter should be about 5% or more if you can. Use organic fertilizer high in organic matter content, especially if you're growing vegetables or fruits. You know, if you can, that would be wonderful. Like I said, if you added any of these, using organic fertilizer, cover crop, compost, or biologically based soil amendments, that helps. For those of you who grow maybe bananas, you realize bananas are heavy feeders. So they like to be fed quite a bit. And so this was where you add the fertilizer. You can add the ones which are granules. And in no time, your bananas will be looking good. If you feed them well, bananas just want two things. They need to be fed well, fertilizer and compost, as well as water. If you're in a place where you have enough water, you're going to grow bananas. So, so you are adding the organic matter commonly used, like I said, and I hope I'm not beating this to the ground, compost or composted manure, peat moss, leaves, straw, sawdust, you can add all that, green manure crops if you have those, or cover crops, of course. Because we said building soil organic matter is the primary strategy for your soil health. It provides nutrients, promote large, diverse microbial community. You know, you've seen the soil. I always can tell. There was a home gun I was working with, and she was growing olive trees. And I'm telling you, every time we dig, you know, in the ground, because she had made the attempts, she had made the, the steps of first improving her soil. There were those big, big earthworms crawling up and just running up and down. You can tell because the soil is healthy. It's, it's thriving. It's vibrating with life. So you add that. Now let's look at the nutrients that you need. There are 16 elements considered essential for plant growth. If any of these 16 elements are lacking, plants cannot complete their vegetative or reproductive cycle. And that's the reason why sometimes we advocate for you to do a soil test so that you get to know what's in your soil. So these 16 nutrients, you know, we start off, of course, with the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Those are readily available in the air. And then we have what we call the primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are needed in large quantities by the plants. Then we have calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Those are secondary nutrients. They are needed also in large amounts, but not the same as the primary nutrients. And then you have the minor nutrients that plants need in smaller quantities. And sometimes when they are lacking, you will see it on the plant. It will show it on the leaves. And these are boron, chlor chloride, copper, iron, zinc, ma molybdenum, manganese, aluminum. So all those are minor nutrients that sometimes may not show up on a fertilizer bag. So like I said, most of the time you have those, these ones are occurring naturally. You have nothing to do with them. They are used in the photosynthesis. And like I said, major nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and micronutrients, boron, chloride, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, zinc. It's not a chemistry class, but... You just need to understand just basically only because when you're buying the fertilizer, I always say, go for the larger numbers here, the NPK. So these are often referred to as the primary nutrients needed in large quantities. So you see on a regular fertilizer bag, like a 10, 20, 20, it means 10% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, 20% potassium. And you can see this one is saying it has minor nutrient. If you look in the back of this bag, you'll see those minor nutrients in very small quantities. It may have zinc or boron or, or manganese or, and, and any of the others, including even the secondary nutrients. Most bags do have that. So you need to just look at the bag and get to understand. But last week, we also showed how the nitrogen, the, the pH affects the other nutrients. This was a soil in a, with where the pH was 7.9, very, very high. So we need to be able to bring this pH lower. We are looking at a pH of between 6 and 6.5, actually, slightly acidic. And we say pH of 7 and above is alkaline. pH of 6, 7 below 7 is acidic. But we want that happy medium so that the other nutrients can be in sufficient range. You can see that phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, they are all in good range. 
And so that was 7.9. And so one of the things we normally want to do to be able to know what is this? This is the report you get when you do your soil test. But we want to start with testing your soil. Why? Because a basic soil analysis provides information on two important soil characteristics, your pH and the available nutrient levels in the soil. Normally, whether it's the calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus, you get to see those so that you know how to amend the soil, whether you need to add the phosphorus, whether you add lime, whether you add dolomite or magnesium sulfate or acidic fertilizers. There are people who just go to the garden center and they buy lime. You know, you're like, okay, I need lime. Just because they had somebody say, you need to add lime. But if you have an alkaline soil, adding lime will make it worse. So you need to add like um, uh, an acidic fertilizer, ammonium sulfate. Usually it's like a 2100. When you do the soil test, that's what you're told to do. So how do you do the soil test? I have a video, by the way, I'll send it to you when I was actually doing the, the actual soil test. But you start with about six locations randomly in your yard. So you take location one, two, three, four, five, and six randomly. You take location one, you can dig the, with a shovel for about eight to 12 inches deep. And then you scoop out the soil, you remove the debris and the grass and you put that in a bucket from position one. And then you do the same for location two, three, four, five, six, each of those and you're putting that same soil into the bucket. And then you mix the soil in the bucket, you take out the debris and the rocks, you take out two cups of that soil, and that is the soil you take to the place where if you are, you are near a university, normally they take the soil to their soil lab. If you're here in Hawaii, in Maui, you take it to the college and they will, you know, every place they charge differently. One of the home gunners I was working with, she was in Virginia and I told her, take it to the University of Virginia. And she did. And they happened to have coupons and they were actually, they didn't even charge her. I think she, they even sent her with a bag where you can put the soil and then you mail it. But here, if you take it to the university in a Ziploc bag, you put what it is that is growing in your garden. If you have lawn, you have fruits, which kind of fruits, you write that down and your address and where the soil was taken, whether it's the backyard, the front yard, where there is lawn or something like that. Sometimes you may divide your soil test. If you have a big space, if your land is big, you may decide to have a soil test for your backyard and then a soil test for your front yard and then a soil test maybe for your side yard. It depends on what's growing. But a regular urban landscape, you don't need all that. You just take it in one place. One will be sufficient. And when you take the soil test for testing, you ask them to send it with the micronutrient as well. So you want both macro and micronutrients in your soil. So you send that. That's a sample form that you do for here. And then, of course, um, they will send back the results to you. And that's when they tell you what you need to add as after they discover what is missing in that soil. Because we said last time, you can see that. I know we are, we are running a little bit out of time, but um, I'll just get to finish this point. When this, the soil is not having sufficient nutrients, it shows up on the leaves, especially on citrus. So normally they'll give you this, this um, uh, report of what to put in, like this is the ammonium sulfate and how much per total acre and how many times you need to apply. And of course, if you're working with somebody who can help you interpret that, that will be fine. So this is another place where I showed you the soil pH was 6.2. That was very acidic. Look at this one, 4.6. You can see all the other nutrients are all affected. So your soil test is very important. Of course, like we said, composting is important. If you're able to do composting, you can. You can do this. It was a three bin. It was a place I used to work at a, at a botanical garden. So they had this as a demonstration kit. And uh, so it's a three bin. So you put your first amount of, you know, your organic materials in the first bin. You keep on moving it in the three bins. By the time it reaches here, it's almost done. Most compost will take about four months if you're in a tropical place. And if you're doing all the right things, in four months to six months, you should have good compost. But if you're in a place which is much colder, probably it might take a year. It depends on the things you're doing and what you're adding. We're going to talk about composting in another session.
And of course, there are people who can buy nowadays, you can buy on, on Amazon, this composting kit that you just keep on, you know, twisting around, you know, just moving it around. There's lots of them. So for those of you who just like to compost, you just be throwing in. It's more of a passive composting because you're just putting the stuff in. But eventually you get the good, you do the recycling, which is the important part of it. And of course, we talk about compost tea for a lot of people who will take that compost, put it in a bag like this and then add water. And they can be using that liquid on their vegetable. It's been proven to really improve, especially when you have seedlings. So as I come to an end, there are lots of different ways you can improve your soil. You can be able to, of course, do solarization. If you have a large piece of land, you can cover the ground and let it rest for a while so that you can come back and, and plant. So that's what I had for you today. I just want to come in really short just so that you can look at each other. If you have a question, let me know. Okay. Wonderful. I hope this session was helpful. Um, I think if we keep on learning and just finding what works, what works in our gardens, um, the formulas that I'm saying start with the soil and then next week we are going to talk about something else. But I think uh, this series, I, I'm, I'm, my hope is that at least you have some idea or two is the takeaway of what you're learning. Again, for those of you who are listening to this, I uh, hope you'll be able to follow up next week. Join us again and we'll continue on. I have a training. It's called the Creating Your Edible Landscape Blueprint. The reason I keep on promoting that uh, program is the fact that it has even this session on soils. One of the modules is all about soils, where I go more in depth with even the demonstrations that I was talking about on how to take your soil test and how to do, um, how to add the fertilizers and all that. So sign up for that. I'm going to, it's the Creating Edible Landscape Blueprint. It's a, it's a session, it's a training that I took, put together. I put a lot of work on that. A lot of good information in it as well. But thank you for joining us. I hope to see you again next week. This is Anne Gachuhi. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm.